today we're, look, we're speaking to Powell resident Paul Souls. Welcome, Paul. Hello. How are you? Paul is, has been a fixture in Canadian theatre, radio and television and film where his face and voice have become instantly recognizable. I do want to point out that Paul has been in this business for seven decades and I'm thrilled to speak to you. Over to you, Paul. You're glad that I'm still alive, that's it. There has a better line. <laughs> and I am too. All right. So, 1930 Toronto. Uh-huh. 1930. What part of Toronto? Apparently, the not the Graf Zeppelin, but the English equivalent, the R100, which was a, a, a Zeppelin of type one, yeah. big airbag, <laughs> came over to Toronto that day. Oh, really? Yeah. It was, it was I a I have no, I have no recollection of it, but <laughs> I did later have a, a very big part of my life was in the air. I had, an air, I had a couple of airplanes. Yeah, I noticed that. that you, have your, you have your pilot license. Yeah, I had a license for a long what time. What part of Toronto were you born in? Uh, where I was born? Yeah, what part? Well, we what, were the hospital? <laughs> Toronto General. Toronto General, good for you. I had very little of it still left. Um, what part of town? We were living on St. Clements Avenue, okay. which was just north of Edmonton and west of uh, Avenue Road. And there was a little kind of a tyrant principal of Allen Public School. Okay, Mr. but the high school around there, there's a big one around there, isn't there? Uh, there are several, I think. That this was a public school, Allen Public School. Okay. And the part of the reason I remember it in, in context of aviation was as a youngster I recall the school was mustered to march down Avenue Road with a police escort to give the colors to what was an a manning depot of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Oh okay. And it was led by a girl whose father was lost. You're talking about a, a Canadian Army, Army depot of that end of town. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But at that time, it was just commissioned as an Air Force manning depot and a warehouse. And her father, this girl who led the parade, had been lost in the Battle of Britain. Oh, I see. So it, it, it stayed with me, the uh, import, gravitas, if you like, or whatever. Uh, and for kids who were in high school, or public school, not very old, it was a significant touchstone for the events of the, of the war and the world, and uh, I've never, never, never forgotten. That was Depression era Toronto. That was Depression era Toronto. You're just coming out I of the do this, but I don't recall either my parents or any members of the family or our circle dealing with things in terms of a depression, more the point of the war. Okay. And Which came, of course, in the mid-40s, early 40s. Mid -40s. Right. Yeah. Well, and you would have been 15 years old with the thought of you signing up. Uh, there was, but I was 15 when the war ended. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, this is true. <laughs> and not a very tall person. <laughs> so I didn't get my chance, although my favorite, uh, almost biblical, the touchstone was a CBC radio program, half an hour, I think Tuesday nights, called L for Lanky. Maybe Monday or Sunday. Uh, a half hour about a, 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 an Avro, um, uh, the, the bomber, the um, four engine bomber. Well, that was used for the, in the war? Yeah. Okay, the, the, the I don't know the name, but yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I know what you're talking about, but I don't know the name of it. Oh, I'm, now I'm embarrassed. <laughs> don't worry, uh, no, we can cut that. <laughs> uh, at any rate... Lancaster? A Lancaster. L for Lanky. And there is, it was his nickname. Lancaster Bomber. Exactly. Link, uh, coming out of Lincoln in England where my parents were. Okay. okay. Yeah, all right, got it. And extremely important to me. So that years later, when I had the opportunity to learn to fly, there was almost no doubt in my mind I was going to. <laughs> it was the manner in which it came to be that was serendipitous and wonderful. I was given my license, essentially, because I was new at CFPL TV in London. So you got your license that early? 
in the, in the 64. 64, I mean, so that's really when you accrue. But I see that you're, can I just, before you touch there, because one of the things, strike by the research that I've done, and actually, just to tell you the honest truth, is so the notes that I gave you, I wrote your bio notes for the Canadian Encyclopedia. Oh, I have, I, well, have, thank I have written your notes. Thank you. What I'm struck by, and is that you got a career going around 1953 as a reporter. I see in notes somewhere that you were at the inaugural season of the Stratford Festival, which is. I did an interview then. But just a minute, let me finish the thought, Paul. Let yeah. me finish the thought. Okay, sorry. Is that the calculations are on IMDb? Your last entry is 2018. Now. My math is not that good, but I used a calculator. It came up with 65 years old. There's no one that I think in this business, and perhaps Christopher Plummer or William Shatner, and I've studied this business. This is my business. That I, well, I sir, agree. you are you are the Canadian film and television. Oh, I know yeah. you want to talk about your flying, but listen to me, sir. I don't don't be embarrassed by this. There's not too many people that I've interviewed in the Canadian film business, and I have interviewed many including Paul Allman, who was right there at the beginning, who, and, and Sarah Pauly, whose mother was right there at the beginning. Sir, you began in 1953. Six, that's seven decades. That's friggin' Lillian Gish territory. Sir, you are a legend, oh, whether yeah. you like it or not. And you're living in Pal, and I'm thrilled. So please talk to me about 1953 and the Stratford Festival. You're going to hear this more than once, my boy. I am a fortunate inheritor of uh, more good luck than good management as a model or whatever. I had no plans or hopes indeed to have endured so long and I'll accept with pleasure Thank you. Uh, and some humility that I've lasted this long to hear that and enjoy it. Thank you. But I don't think I ever planned to do it or expected well, tell me about 1953. But I, got, I was lucky. My mother and dad, old, good genes. Right. In 50, in, in 50. Well, well, I think there is a contradiction. There is, in the Canadian Encyclopedia, you studied fine arts. In the Wikipedia, you studied psychology at the University of Western Ontario. I, I, I'm afraid I have to set your record straight by saying, officially, the uh, aegis or title would have been studying psychology. Oh, okay. Rather than, I Why? think I think somebody uh, very kindly put fine in front of arts, <laughs> but it was an arts a degree I was going for, okay. and um, the psychology was my understanding of the sort of faculty I was uh, okay. engaged under. I remember, for example, uh, a professor who introduced us to J.D. Salinger. Really? Catcher in the Rye, right. the most famous absolutely. book of our time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and he introduced us to Salinger, of course, for that novel and the nine short stories. This is almost enough. Nobody has to read any much more to have <laughs> a lifetime. An, an appreciation of good writing. And human nature. And human nature. So I was lucky. And, and, and again, you're lucky. This, you'll hear this time and time again, I'm sorry, is that I got lucky by being in these places at, at this good time. And these are the people I thank for making the period somewhat useful. Did you? Because left to my own devices, I probably wouldn't have. Did you interview Tyrone Guthrie? Never Tyrone Guthrie, although, um, do you know Michael Bakri? No, that name I don't know. Uh, an Englishman who came over as Bakri's assistant, uh, not Bakri, but uh, uh, not Guthrie's assistant. Who is Guthrie's assistant? That I don't know, I'm sorry. I should uh, tell you. So he's had a Canadian context and almost became, well, he certainly was the best improviser I ever saw. <laughs> and he just sort of came out of the ether from England. Right. Landed at Stratford. Uh, Okay, go on. Uh, I don't want to now, you, confuse then, you. And then you, you took on a hosting job, one of your first hosting jobs. 
Well, that's that, that's CFPL, which which they're proud to say is one of the first television stations. It was the first. CBC went on air in 1952. You Correct. went on air in 1953. Right. But and you don't think you're a legend or an icon? Well, I have to clear the record for this. CFPL was literally the first station on the air that dug a hole in the ground and built a building to house the station. Yeah. Yeah. CKSO in Sudbury went on the air a month or two before CFPL, oh, really? but only by <laughs> plugging a, 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 a cable into the, the side of a wall in a gymnasium and they said, well, we're on the air. <laughs> well, CFPL started from a whole new building and was, you know, there were three levels of broadcasting in Canada, radio and TV. There was CBC, right. CFPL, right. and the rest of the country. <laughs> yes. And I was lucky enough to be, you know, in... I know well, London has a proud tradition. I, I addressed the people at the University of Western Ontario once and made the mistake of not acknowledging the fact that they were there at the beginning. They were, indeed. And that's thanks I to think. Walter J. Blackburn, who had connections with the Progressive Conservative Party. Okay. And was given the license. these license privileges by virtue of his political uh, uh, affiliations. And said. then they became part of the CTV loose network. Oh, but that was, was years, years later. later. Years later. Many. Yeah, many years later. But they became a, a conglomerate as a person. That's right. Yeah, 30. No. You must have been asked to death about Take 30, but tell, tell us a little bit about that. No, you, you ask your question. Well, 1962 to 1978, that takes up to me about 16 years of stories to tell. Yes, What's your I best have... stories? Tell me one of your best stories. Uh, Come on, tell, tell us one of your best stories. Adrian Clarkson. <laughs> Adrian Clark, I'll tell us one of your No, well, I mean, that's a story. <laughs> she was, uh, I got lucky again. In 62, I came to Toronto after nine years at CFPL uh, on the basis that I wondered if people were starting to get sick and tired of this personality or this face. <laughs> In London, you mean? <laughs> yeah. I came to Toronto and did two auditions and got them both. One of them was Take 30, and the uh, person I interviewed for the audition was Paul Fox, who was the principal of Arendelle College, University of Toronto, and the most wonderful man who could take the most complicated political science problem practical and make it intelligible, interesting, uh, almost mandatory. Uh, and his wife, uh, Joan, became Take 30's film critic. And it was she who one day said, you know, you mark my words. But this guy's going to be a big star one day, and she was referring to Clint Eastwood. Really? She had reviewed one of his spaghetti westerns. Oh, but this would be after like mid '60s. This was yeah. well, no, this was, yeah, this was in the yeah. in the in the '60s. Yeah, yeah. They got released in the early '60s, '62, '63, right. '64. But we, no one would ever really have known that this guy yeah. Eastwood was anything, <clears throat> really, before Joan. I've always said that whoever would have thought that Clint Eastwood from 1962 would be the top American director and still working. That I just found <laughs> extraordinary. You know, a just well, unbelievable American icon of filmmaking. So of course, fan. <laughs> this was one of the gifts of being around at that time and being part of a network show with four outstanding co-hosts, the first of which was Anna Cameron. Second of which was Adrian. Future Governor General. Future Governor General. The uh, third was Mary Lou Finley. Mary Lou Finley. Future yeah. The fourth was uh, Holly Gardner. Really, had a lot of crew. Uh, so it was, I was, again, a pretty rich time to be around and have a partnership with these great talents. Who ever told you that you had a talent for the voice? Now I'm referring to the fact that... I'll tell you who. Now let me just set this up, please. Let me set it up. <laughs> Slap your wrist, sir. You know what I'm getting to. You must know what I'm getting to. Because in 1964 and 1966, you were doing Peter Parker. You were doing... What's his name? Hermie? 
from uh, Red Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, you were doing the Hulk, you were doing Captain America. Didn't do the Hulk. America. That's a mistake. Bruce Banner, that's a mistake? Bruce yeah. Banner's a mistake? No, that was Max Ferguson did uh, Bruce Banner. Or did, yeah, did Bruce Banner. I mean, where, who told you you could do voice? Or did you well, just know you could do voice? Again, good luck. And the founder of it all was my late cousin, Bernard Cowan, who was a frontline uh, announcer when announcing was a profession, a good, an honorable one, at <laughs> CBC. Uh, and it was Bunny who cast me to do these cartoon roles because Bunny was the producer of them on behalf of American producers. The first of whom were Rankin and Bass, Jules uh, uh, Bass and uh, Arthur Rankin, who produced the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer with Burl Ives as the only name. But a big name in those days. A big very name. big name and the only person from that series who over the years, and it's been a number of years. It's been a number, 64. He's the only one that ever made any money off okay, the show. I knew where you were going with that. Because what well, did you get paid? 40 bucks an hour mean, or something? The like fact of the matter is that the, our union, ACTRA, right. was not nearly as developed as it is today. Well, again, it's very early time for talking about. We didn't negotiate a contract in which there would be residuals. So none of the original cast, except Burlides. for Burl Lives, got any big residual American money. But you must, after 64, I mean, that's the Beatles, that's Hard Day's Night. People still talk to you about that. How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you respond to that? No, again, with uh, the aphorism, I'm sorry, I was just lucky to be there at okay. the, time. the, right place, I have, the right time. I have a series of five photographs on my wall at home of the Fab Four. There was a press conference at Maple Leaf Gardens when they arrived. Are you, have you got a signed autograph, Fab Four? Haven't got a signed autograph. Okay. I have no autographs, but I have these five black and white photos oh, okay. with two members of Toronto's finest right. to help keep order, although none was needed. I was there. Well, fine. I was there. I was there. To Bruce. this press conference, and it was it, you know, they were expecting mayhem, and the kids were wonderfully behaved. And it was a heck of an evening right. to be part of this, uh, you know, the gardens at that time held what, 12,000? 15, something around there. Lee, after yeah, that. After a while, they had yeah, yeah. seats. But at yeah, it's around 12,000. Let's say 12, 13, yeah. yeah. million, thousand. Yeah, thousand. Uh, yeah. And it was an extraordinarily civilized, well-behaved evening, and the idea that you could, you could, today you couldn't get away with it. They'd have security by the billions. In those days, you didn't really need that. I just want to focus now. I know a lot of people go with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, but Spider-Man is an extraordinary thing. I mean, there's no way that anyone, I know this because I'm a big fan of this stuff and I've studied history daily. I know my comics. Spider-Man was invented in 1962. This is It's only four years after, so there's no recognition. But this character, about 50 years later, 60 years later, would be up in the range of, as I was saying to Norman earlier, there is there's Mickey Mouse, there's Winnie the Pooh, and there's Spider-Man. Spider-Man sure, yeah. is, is Beijing to Cairo to Rio de Janeiro to Melbourne to L.A. Everyone knows Spider-Man. You've been associated with, I swear to God, Paul, that when your obit comes around, and it when will, will, when your obit comes around, and it will, uh, the first couple of lines is they're going to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a generation that yeah. Spider-Man is their territory, it is, they belong to it. That, generation X, Millennials, Spider-Man is there. That's fine, I'll be gone. However, now, <laughs> you were about now the I'm point I'm trying to make is that you were the first voice of Peter Parker. Allow me to say, though, while I accept all that and appreciate the privilege, yeah, the both. fact of the matter is that I experienced being on stage at the Sky Festival. <laughs> yes, I know. And occasionally in lead roles. Yes. And, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get and to that. I, I don't want to overstate that. that. Yes, much more. Uh, I, I still get yeah. nerves. 
and quivers when I think of those times at Stratford. Now let me just finish, let me finish the point of that because I, I must admit that's my own peculiarities. I will get to stage work. Is that you were bought paid like forty dollars a week or something? Like that. No residuals, and you were just getting paid Where? Oh, for for doing Rudolph and Spider Man and all. Oh, not even that. You said no residuals, but what were you getting? We got a session fee, which was uh, fifty dollars and up or whatever, uh, for. Uh, Spider-Man, there were, I don't know how many recording sessions there were. Uh, each season had maybe three. You would do five or six episodes per session. The tracks would go down to New York or Milan or Tokyo or wherever to be animated, but we did them in Toronto. Right. At, uh, generally one studio, Eastern Sound. Right. The first one was done at uh, uh, RCA. Of a Cumberland? That was at Cumberland. Yeah. RCA was on Mutual Street, just below okay. Cumberland. Right. Yeah. Now, let's, let's move to theater then, because you do have a long, long arm in the theater, not just voice and film. A couple of ones they do note here that uh, Diary Van Frank, which you did with uh, Eli Watt, Kate Reed, 1977. And Ann Jackson, who was Kate, er, uh, Eli's wife. And then you did a touring version of Bright Beach Memoirs. You did, and what one that you particularly like is I'm Not a Rappaport. I'm Not a Rappaport is the only play I ever deliberately went after to make sure I got. I was in New York for some reason, can't recall why, and this play was on, and I hadn't heard of it, except that uh, the author, uh, Herb um, Gardner, uh, has written it, and uh, I went to see it. You know, you, you could walk on Broadway in those days, and they had booths, ticket booths, right on Broadway, and you were directed to one set of theaters or another, and I got in this line, and I give me one for uh, one for uh, I never had before. So I sat in the front row of the balcony, and the curtain hadn't been up for five minutes. And I came half out of my seat and said, I've got to do this play. And right from that moment, I said, I've got to do that play. And I went through a couple of little machinations at home here in Toronto to get the audition and to get a second audition and get the part was by no means a, a given, but I went after it and I... And where did you open? Well, here at the at, at, uh, um, Tan Stage. We, we called it the... Uh, uh, what was it? Oh, come on. Well, the Canadian State. The Canadian State, right. Oh, okay. It was formed as a result... There's a front street there. Yeah. That's right, right. Of, yeah, okay. of the... Uh, of course. And I was in one of the opening year productions, uh, an Italian play, Christian Fry. Um, it was a centennial project by the construction industry, the theater. But the theater company prospered in, in the years afterwards, but it was a centennial creation. 1967. Yeah. A wonderful theater to play in. Right. You said you were also? Still working for ZFPL when Stratford came along. Right. And was assigned to do an interview with Francis Highland, whose husband was George McCowan. Okay. Oh, the director. That's right. right. And they were into sports cars, as was I. So, I was sent down uh, from London to Stratford to pick up Francis, bring her to London, do the interview, and take her back in a company Chevrolet. London Free Press. And they had this car, and I had an Austin Healy at the time. So I said to Francis, how would you like to go back in the Healy? Well, she took up to that. I said, how would you like to fly back? I had just got my license to fly. And she said, that'd be terrific. So we flew her back. And this was just great, great fun. 
And so how, how many times did you, did you actually appear on the Stratford stage or? I was there for four seasons. Four seasons. It's a most wonderful situation. If you are kind of once in place, I didn't find this out until it happened, but I became the candidate for Shylock in Merchant of Venice when Al Waxman, a right. passed memory, yeah. passed away on the operating table. And within a month, I was approached to take his place in Merchant of Venice in 1901. 2001. You were also Macbeth with Chris Plummer. Well, I had done... And Glenda Jackson as Lady Macbeth. A tour with those two uh, before that, all through New England. And that talked about another good fortune that was around in New York uh, when the call went out for Canadians, because there were Canadian money okay. behind that production with Plummer and Jackson. And I was, you know, a Canadian supporting actor and uh, qualified to help them with their, their casting requirements. It was a kind of a plus to be a Canadian uh, in those days. And uh, I was just, again, lucky. Uh, ragtime. You were know, also ragtime, the musical. Well, that was done here. In, in trust oh, the Canadian production in the right, mid yeah. uh, 90s. Okay. Yeah, uh, that was Garth Kravinsky. And uh, I well, notoriety. Well, uh, it and was you, again. Don't tell me you got a Garth Kravinsky story. What's that? Don't tell me you have a Garth Kravinsky story. Not really, no. I, I don't. Uh, just that I got cast, uh, and I presume he had something to do with it, because well, he had something yeah, to do with everything. Yeah, it being him uh, in the showboat. Yeah, and I was extremely grateful to be part of that live end. original company. Do you, I would like to tell my anecdote about Garth Dabrinsky. He started Cineplex in 1979, and that was part of his legacy with Nat Taylor, and he sold it, and it went through. It just recently got bought for $2.8 billion. So something he started from uh, from a nickel and a dime with Nat Taylor in 1979 just sold for $2.8 no time that guy was a brilliant guy. No question. Too bad he wasn't an honest guy. I won't make any comments about that. I know you won't. No, no. So? Uh, but... Uh, I'm not asking you to. No. Okay. I've written, I've written about him. It. I've written about you, but, I've written about him. <laughs> but I, I still <laughs> consider it a matter, a stroke of luck, right. that I was cast in that. In right yeah. In right time. And in fact, one day, after a matinee performance, we were coming out of the theater for the supper break, stage door, and there's a fellow at the call board reading, you know, who's in it. And it was, uh, oh, here we go. Zed. Um, Moses? No, uh, he was in Taxi. Uh, Oh, oh no, I'd never watched Taxi. Danny DeVito is the only one I know from Taxi. Well, in that, in that film, uh, he was one of the stars. Oh, the film Taxi? The Taxi. TV series. The TV, yeah, I, again, I didn't watch it, so. Oh, I'm embarrassed. I am embarrassed, too. Yeah, I'm, all I know is Danny DeVito was in Taxi, but also that guy, that comedian, was in Taxi. That's right. That, that, uh, that, that disturbed comedian who died young. That kid, Jim Carrey, played a man in the room. Oh, oh, you're, oh you're thinking of... Uh, uh, Andy Kaufman. Kaufman, yeah. Now, uh, anyway, I, I've got to come back to this because okay. he was he was kind to me, and there he was, uh, and I met him during right time. Oh, great! Which uh, I had done Rappaport, he had done Rappaport. Okay, he but did a different production. on Broadway, and now I was like meeting this icon, and uh, it was terrific. Great, Judd Hirsch. Judd Hirsch. Why I can't, why I can't well, think of Zed's, I don't know. Anyway, it came, it came. Here he was looking at the call board and gave me a nice little compliment. We ended up having dinner later, not that night, but another night. He was in Toronto doing something at the Royal Oak. You just recently got an award for a web series. Can you believe? In well, my, in tell my me hundreds, about yeah. My 90 yeah. year old roommate, which yeah. I've watched online. 
very funny, odd stuff. It's a good thing my mother had passed away by then. The idea of doing swear words. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of... There's <laughs> she would have been... Uh, I was so grateful that she unfortunately... I had got really to bad some. taste in doing live streaming someone's brisk, which I thought was hilarious. Well, <laughs> but indeed. It, it's, it's and a, there were some dirty words. But, which, so, tell, so tell me about this. How do you get... Oh, let me just scan for the, for the setup. It's called My 90-Year-Old Roommate. Yeah. It is a webcast sponsored or is paid for by the CBC. But you have to go onto YouTube and sign up into YouTube to see it. Although it does, it's free, yeah, right. it's free but you still have to yeah. get through Google and into whatever, YouTube, yeah. whatever. But it's there and it's free and it's yeah. online. Yeah. And it's quite sophisticated. I mean, it's not just really cheapy shot. There's a script. It was, it was all improv. Was it? Because Every it sounds, word. It sounds scripted. I mean, it really is very, very good improv. Thank you, Ethan, for that and the directors who did that first series, uh, they brought enough out of us that we did that with conviction. Uh, I, I mean, I remember the last line in the episode I liked the best about being an Uber driver. <laughs> and I got to swear and I thought, oh, my mother had never heard this. I could never go home. But it was it was great fun. When I started to do the research on that, the, the producer directors didn't know who you were. Didn't know if they could find you being a ninety year old guy to fill the part. Oh, there were guys around. And they became part of our gang. It was like a four man gang. But they weren't around to see Take Thirty. No, I guess not. <laughs> not maybe maybe. <laughs> maybe they see Rudolph the Red Book. Right again. Here. Good luck. Good luck. Let's go back to something which you obviously started with, which you obviously part of a passion, which is flying. Yes. So let's talk a bit about flying. Well, again... You got I, your license early. I did, and it was given to me by uh, uh, Noble. Um, t uh, not Ty, Ty, Ty two, two guys were my instructors. One of whom was the uh, president of the Canadian Flying Clubs Association. And he could see in the early days of television, this was going to be a phenomenon. So he went around to a couple of us said, the TV stations in our neighborhood, of which London was the center. And he said, I'll give cost-free a license to one of your hosts if you want to advance him. And all he has to do is talk up fly. So he picked me. I essentially got my license for nothing uh, at the hands of... Uh, and you trained out in London? Or in London, Ontario. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I became part of the auxiliary uh, squadron of the RCAF that, uh, because... It, do you ever see the, the film of Battle of Britain? Yes. And it essentially said, Olivier said, we need pilots. Yes, and they got trained in Canada. We, if we have, we can have airplanes, Smiths, Hurricanes, whatever, but we need pilots. And the Canadians and the Commonwealth, at the end of the Second World War, took that seriously and hired guys who were pilots during the war to be part of an auxiliary flying old or Second World War airplanes so they had a coterie of trained pilots, should there be another war coming along with the Russians or whatever. They said, never again will we find ourselves without pilots. Without the pilots. And that's what the uh, auxiliary was all about. And I was part of that. Do you know there's actually a film about that? Canadian film called For the Moment, starring I Russell, Russell Crowe. It was made in the 90s. Russell Crowe is not a star, oh. but he stars as a Commonwealth pilot from Australia who's trained in Manitoba. Yes. And he has a relationship with a girl there. Sure, sure, sure. It's called For the Moment, and it's quite a well, nice little uh, film, but it's I precisely know. about that, of these boys being trained yeah. so they can be shipped overseas yeah. to die, which is part of the sure. point of the movie. So you actually got lucky because you didn't actually, they didn't ship you That's overseas. Right. You That's would right. have gone. I bet you if you were 17, 18, by the would have. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I had joined. I, you enjoyed it, right? You in my it. early 20s. Yeah. So what have you flown? What sort of, what sort of craft have you flown? I mean, how well, big? I, I, planes that I own, primary trainers of the RCAF, 
Uh, one of them was a string and canvas <laughs> biplane called the Fleet Finch, okay. which I own. And another one, a Canadian designed and built trainer called a Chipmunk. Oh, okay. A world beater uh, built by de Havilland, designed in Canada. And I owned one of each of these for a short period of time. Look. I bet you have an opinion about the Avaral. I do. Well, let's hear it. Well, uh, he's dead now, so I won't say anything. Are you getting chicken out? I know the story. Well, everybody knows the story in a way. But I mean, one should. But, but I mean, all the technology that went into that plane. It's just extraordinary. It, 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 the, the story I think the is story is that those guys went down to work for NASA. Yeah. Well, I mean, I they mean, couldn't work in Ontario to build the Ever House. What do they go down to NASA to put a man on the moon? Oh, Jesus, what Deep Baker is. Mean, well, should have been, people think you should have been put up the wall shot for doing that. I might have suggested the same thing <laughs> at one point or another, but you're not supposed it's to. It's done. done. I know. What's done what is it? done. Um, but he chopped them up and threw them in Lake Ontario. That I'll never understand. No, that's what I'm saying. I won't forgive that. I, what did you do that for? I mean, what? I mean, there's a that, cowardice in having created this thing and then scrapping it. It's, Have you no pride? Well, the story was that the Americans would just wouldn't accept the fact that Canadians were doing this shit. You know, they just well, at whose behest? <laughs> so I said, they went down to work. Well, no. anyway, so uh, you, do you still do you still fly? I haven't flown since 08. Uh, when the crash of 08 came or whatever, right. uh, I sold the airplane then. I have had nothing since. Uh, I don't think I've flown in hours since. My son also has a license. Um, we had some very nice adventures together with the old Fleet Finch. Went to Oshkosh together. That's, uh, that was a so talk about going back to the origins of history. What's up today, sir? What is what is Pulse Holes up to? Are you, are you, are you, do you feel that you're... How do you feel? Where, where are you no, going? I'd be happy to work. Yeah. Look, I wake up every day and look in the newspaper and there's a, there's a story about Christopher Blubber. And I think, well, we're the same age, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think I can think as fast as he does. You know, I look upon people like you and Christopher, where I said that at the beginning, it's just quite extraordinary that you, it's a tough, bloody business. Didn't it, it's a tough business to be in. Wow. To survive for so long, it's, well, survive or not thrive, it is, it is to, to make a living, not just survive, but to make yeah, a living. Yeah. And make a decent living, and, and which is, as you darn well know, in this country, in the arts, is not an easy... No, you're quite right. Living in this building is, is primary truth to that fact. Yeah. And so you said you did get lucky, and then and jeans. Look, I toured for six months. Talent, with sir, don't, with don't plumber, you are and a talented People like to have you on set. I mean, obviously you're an easygoing guy. I, I don't think I disgraced myself too much. I don't think I cheated anybody <laughs> on any wages. I think we're going to about coming to an end. <laughs> you know, well, I've wandered off. <laughs> but anyway, is there anything you would like to finish off with? You have to say. No, I, 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 seriously. We thought it would be going for a as good you, hour now. As yeah. we talk about this. You do know this is going on YouTube. You know this is where it's going to end up. Look. You okay with that? I, as long as I get to say that I was lucky, I have been, I've been privileged to be taken under the wing of some pretty heavy hitters. Right. So how can I complain, which I wouldn't do, more to the point, I get a chance to say thank you to those who had some confidence in me. And right there, just say it to you too, thank you. And I, I say thank I'll you. I'll say for it to you all. Thank you. See ya.